Anyway, here we go. Bernard Franklin Company started a job there out of desperation in New Jersey, and I ran into trouble with uh, conflict there immediately. Didn't want a romantic, romantic relationship with Kathy, nor was I able to sell anything because the company wasn't going to make it properly. These were tough times. I ran into 24-hour security with Bob. He was a homeless guy they put in an elevator, and he didn't know who I was. and started to fight me because I parked in the parking lot because I worked there. Well, finally, Act 2, Scene 1. In a sales area at lunchtime, Ber Bernie, Frank, and Tony were out to lunch. General con conversation narrowing in on the three stooges that ran the company, these three guys. I did my famous invitation of Bernie's penny-pinching penchant. There was outright hilarity as I walked in circles in Bernie's office overlooking the general office area. One foot in the trash can I put, and the other lampshade on my head, a cigar like a pen, a cigar like pen in my mouth, telling everyone to stop spending so much money on electricity as they flick the light switches on and off. People were just laughing over the, over the bent over. I was just about to go stage right. Everyone in the audience was rolling in the aisles. I bumped into Bernie in the doorway to his office, coming back from lunch. He looked at me and listened to part of my act and let out a nervous laugh and said he really thought I was funny. Because I have one foot in a trash can and a lampshade on my head, you know. And he's the CEO. I got the last laugh Friday afternoon after everyone had left. He got the last laugh. I packed my things and put them into my new Honda. I, I, re I sold my Z28, couldn't afford it. I rented out my house and went west, California bound, gave my furniture away for a song and a dance. Goodbye, sweet house. You know, I enjoyed fixing up that house in Cherry Hill. She was an old tub when I brought, bought her, and the, the couple that owned her was trying to cheat one another on it. The ex-husband tried to sell it to his girlfriend for a song so he wouldn't have to pay his ex-wife so much. Then he figured out he would keep the house anyway through a backdoor deal with his new love. I bid a few hundred dollars more in cash, and the judge in the inevitable court case gave me the house deal of my life. I transformed that little house into a little red colonial dollhouse, cherry tree on the right, five birch trees on the left. I used a paint chart to do the house in graduated shades of red. Doors and shutters were barn red, frames and trim light red, and the rest of the house was and columns were in kind of a pastel, all in the same color family. The driveway and sidewalks matched the house. I, I pu painted, uh, used Sherwin-Williams paint and put gravel in it, or sand, and uh, it looked like a new roof had reddish black tiles as well. It looked like, it was a showstopper. I really enjoyed building it up like that. Passers would stop by to look, especially when the cherry hill, cherry tree was in full bloom. Inside was sculptured carpeting and a fancy wrought iron railing up the entrance stairway to the elevated living room. A large pink silk screen dogwood tree reflected in the multiple square mirrors as you came in. I bought a bunch of square mirrors and put them on the wall. I was getting to be pretty handy. When I walked into the house, I was always looking for the guy who belonged there. I still had the kitchen and bedrooms to do, but I didn't identify as actually being a resident. But I was enjoying every minute fixing her up. There was a Navy captain and his wife who, who bought it. That's what I did all this for. It was time to move on to California, because the economy was dropped and there were no jobs to be had. Chapter 6, W.W. W. Cannon Company. A little short of the West Coast, the little red Honda was not a good long-distance road car. Clothing leaked out of every window and the sunroof. When I made it to Texas, going on the way to California, I decided to plant myself for a while there. The economy was reported very doing very well, and it was. But... What was I? I was a Yankee down south. Didn't know this. Never experienced this. I interviewed for a sales job at a personnel agency. Company, Cannon Company had put in a request for someone at the same agency with my qualifications. Looked like it was a magic fit. But it took two months for the personnel company to match us up. They told me that the requests were in the same letter tray. Fortunately, no one else was hired in the meantime. My first month's commission was charity. Nearly $7,000 for a job that Bob Chauncey engineered and sold. He was one of the ex-sales uh, managers that was semi-retired. 
I whooped and hollered in my little red Honda like a native-born Texan, all the way home to my new apartment in a huge yuppie complex called The Village on Lover's Lane. I might have said the word y'all a couple of times, even. Boy, that was generous of them. I never made that much money in a month. I figured I'd be living in the Taj Mahal in six months. The economy was going, and I was going to make some money. Ed, my sales manager, kept harping on my Yankee ways. I found out later he was from Michigan. But he had mastered all that nautical talk like y'all and stuff. Every day I was asked about being a Yankee. Every day, my, with my New York accent, I thanked people for thinking I was a professional baseball player. I didn't want to get into the, the, uh, the uh, belittlement there. The good old boys had ways to straighten out Yankees. One trick was to tell me that time for sales meetings was a half hour after they were to begin. Then everyone would scold me for being late. I started getting there really early Monday mornings to be sure to be on time. Then they'd all gradually sneak back into the meeting room until I noticed I was the only one there in the office. Then they'd wait to see how long it'd take me to realize I was late again and scold me all over again. It really got old. New guy in the block. Join the crowd. It just wasn't in me to say y'all and stuff. Ed tried to get me to join the good old boys at the local watering hole at Bachman Lake every night. I liked to work out, so drinking right after work was not my thing. I'd come over once in a while and have an OJ at the, on the rocks with everyone. But the cigarette smoke got to me. I would stay a short time, then was off to President's Health Spa. I never really fit in. I just had a different lifestyle. Wow, Europe for two. Well. I worked like a dog, nine to five every day, no early days like good, the good old boys who took off early around two or three. Burroughs had a contest that year, they were one of our suppliers. One week in Marbella, Spain. So we all tried to sell as much as we could. I sold just enough bench bars to make the wild card. So I won the trip to Europe. That was a wild card trip. It was hardly enough to pay for the cost of the trip, but I wasn't gonna say anything. I just couldn't believe it. It's a naive little me going to Europe for the first time. I called the ex to see if I couldn't take my oldest son, Timmy. He was nine, a good companion to share our first time abroad. The two of us would be wide-eyed over there. I really looked forward to that. They even had a one day in North Africa. She refused to let me take him. Take all three boys or none, she said. I didn't have the money to take the other two. My heart sank. I didn't want to go alone. Should have asked one of my tennis buddies. Instead, this fool, me, asked an old girlfriend I dated in Dallas. I quickly discovered the reason why I broke up with her. Everyone from Can Cannon Company stopped off in New York City a couple of days before the flight to Madrid to take in a few sights. The group from Houston was a spectacle. There was a sister company in Houston where I was in Dallas. Shiny grapefruit-sized belt buckles, boots, and one-gallon hats looking up at all them their skyscrapers. They really s stuck out. New Yorkers were disappointingly friendly to them. They expected a lot of hassle. Boy, it's really windy here. Well, the boys sauntered down the depths of terror of the subway. New Yorkers were disappointingly friendly. They found out that every war they went, People smiled at them. People would ask, hey, who shot JR? They'd give good directions. New Yorkers are like that. Most New Yorkers aren't hassles. One time on the way to the Statue of Liberty, two guys got off the subway and walked with us so we wouldn't get lost. It gave them all a different point of view about Yankees, especially ones from New York. They were very helpful. That evening, the boys and me were going to take in Annie on Broadway. That's the Broadway show. I told them it was formal, so they put on their corduroy jackets. Dinah, my old ex-girlfriend, micromanaged me from the minute I picked her up in Dallas. She sensed my distancing. She demanded I hand over a plane ticket to Madrid, right on the sidewalk in front of everyone, so I wouldn't let her send her home. I was thinking of it. Well. The 747 over there was long and tiring and I couldn't sleep. When we arrived in Madrid, they counted heads and couldn't fit all of us on the connecting flight to Marbella. There was a holiday going on or something. All the restaurants were closed. So after staying up all night on the plane, the, str the stragglers were given a tour of the palace. That's myself and Donna and a, a couple dozen others and an imitation hamburger at Burger King. 
someone said it was cheaper than putting us in hotel rooms. So we couldn't rest up for the connecting flight. Security was tight everywhere. Uzi toting funny hats were on top of every building. I was so tired. I almost got arrested for trying to sit in a chair in the palace that we were visiting. The muzzle on the Uzi pointed its message. Out of the chair, senor. I was reminded that the furniture had a history with royalty, not commoners. We ended up, we ended the tour standing in the palace courtyard waiting for a bus. Again, no seating. We were still not allowed to sit, not even on the ground, out of respect for the monarchy. Donna was so tired that she stopped bugging me. Finally, on the flight to Morbea, we got a chance to sit down. Then our luggage was lost. Another three hours shot. Donna stayed in her room and waited for me to bring the luggage from another flight into Marbella. She was already fretting because she left her formal dress back in Dallas and wouldn't have anything to wear at the final dinner. I was so exhausted that I couldn't even take a nap. So I went down to the beach and plopped down on one of the beach chairs. I saw the Mediterranean Sea for the first time. It was lovely. But in that moment, just then, a huge boxer with a slobbering mouth came right up to me. He took one look went to the foot of my chaise lounge and deposited the biggest pile of steaming waste I'd ever seen. Welcome to Europe. They must have known I was coming. I felt a strange isolation. Every couple had their place with a certain other couples. And then there was Donna and Bob. Donna was a looker. Dinner and sleep. We took our first bus tour the next day. Donna was all camera. She took pictures of everything, even a rose at the brake station. She insisted on the window seat the whole time. If she saw something on the other side of the bus, she screamed, out of my way. If I didn't jump into the aisle, she would actually step across my leg. Her heels dug into my thighs more than once. The next day, Donna flirted continuously with the tour guide. Pepe, his name, had curly hair and a mustache that surrounded his face. He was a likable guy, except he stole my girl. So I gradually faded to the back of the group as we turned here and there. They looked like a nice couple, her arm and his all the time. I became so embarrassed that I waited to see which tour bus she and Pepe would take each day and took the other one. Donna was incensed with this. She said it looked bad. Well, she's, I guess, testing me or something. I avoided her at dinner, too. She became the nagging wife the more I retreated. Every day ended with a tour of the stores so we could have our wallets empty. I noticed that the store owners were putting higher price tags up just before the group guy came by. The guy kept telling me us to stay with him because he held our passports. If we got lost, he threatened we'll, we'd be in a foreign country without ID. There was only one ferry, so I accompanied Donna to North Africa. The naive Tunisians all had bad teeth, fast hands, and bad breath. The water, the water was bad, so everyone drank Coca-Cola. They'd come up to you and put their hands everywhere on your body and in your pockets and on your hair. They were begging for money, obviously poor. Donna panicked and moved back to where I was walking. I shielded her from everyone. I'd never seen her this vulnerable before. After touring a couple of interesting spots, we went to a storefront restaurant. The kushkush, -kush, some kind of chicken, was topped with a half-cooked chicken that I wouldn't give to the boxer. The atmosphere was exotic. An ugly belly dancer was ro with rolls of fat bouncing around every which way he entertained us. The, water, the waiter kept telling me to eat the raw chicken. I threw my dinner piece by piece under the table to avoid insulting him. It's time to leave. The dancer seemed angry that no one put money in her outfit. Just outside the door, Clyde the camel grunted in my face as he planted a kiss on my lips before I had a chance to duck. One dollar, his owner demanded, for luck. Donna went hysterical again when the natives surrounded our group. They all reached out to touch her. She was indeed beautiful, but an untouchable beauty, fragile. Our, our group became her shield. She walked in the middle of our circle. Tears poured down her face. She remained hysterical all the way back to the ferry. When we boarded, she slipped through the crowd and disappeared. I looked all over for her. I hoped she didn't jump overboard. There were all kinds of people on that large ship. When I came to the rear, I saw our group sitting together on the benches, and that were attached to the rounded stern of the ship. Jerry spoke over the din of the engines. Where's Donna? I sat down next to him and yelled, I don't know, I've looked all over for her. I was about to panic, thinking she'd jumped overboard. Just then she appeared in the doorway and walked right to me. Her face was marked with fresh tears and sunburn. 
She was even more beautiful in her vulnerability than I'd ever seen her before. Jerry moved over to make room. 